So one of the problems that we had with this application was that, let me just run that one more time here. If we take a look at our list of movies, I can go into a movie, I can edit it. When I type, nothing happens. If I go back, I don't see any change on the view screen, but on the list screen, I do see the changes that I made. So let's see what's going on with the type with the data behind the scenes here. This data in this movie list here is coming from this movie's flow. And if we take a look at that in the DAO, the movie DAO, we have a get movies flow here, which returns flow list movie. And this does a couple things. It immediately returns a flow, which is basically a, a stream of things coming to us one at a time. And we have that immediately. We don't get blocked. Behind the scenes, the database is going to go fetch all those movies. And then once it has the movies, it's going to take that list and emit them to the flow for us to receive. In addition, any time the movies change, so if you insert a movie, delete a movie, edit a movie, any of that, it will automatically send a brand new list to us. And that's one of the advantages of using a flow here. So back in the movie view model, anytime we have a movie change, edit, deleted, it will end up getting, the new list of movies will get refreshed to us. So that's why we see that get refreshed here. What we've done on the movie edit screen is we said that any time uh, the user types something in either of these text fields, um, hold on one second, somebody's trying to join and it looks like they're having trouble. And where is my, let's see. Ah. Uh, They're getting a session expired. Please, re please refresh the login. Um, I'm just going to respond there. Try refreshing the browser. Okay, so hopefully that'll help. <coughs> Pardon me. So um, in this text field, when we're editing these movies, whenever I type something in this field, this text field function that we defined is gonna say anytime the text changes, call on value change, which is something that we pass in. Note that we say on value change because the value that we're seeing hasn't actually changed yet. It's we're just the user starting to type a new value. And so when we go back to where that text field is used for on value change, we pass in this little lambda. And what he's doing is anytime the text on that title field or description field changes, we're calling on movie change, which was passed in as a parameter to our movie edit screen. So every key press is going through and calling on movie change. And what we're doing is we're picking up the movie that we're representing on the screen and making a copy of it with the new value. Let's see what that on movie change is actually doing. So if we look at where our movie edit screen is defined, we'll see over here that uh, on, uh, was that the one that I had? Yes, so uh, the, the function for actually changing the movie edit if we look at this on movie change is the last parameter, it's a functional parameter. So we can actually move it outside of the paren. That's normally what you do if you only have a single Lambda and it's the last parameter being passed in. So this is the on movie change here. We're gonna kick off a coroutine. So we're doing work in the background and then update it in the database. Now updating it in the database is gonna affect that initial list screen that we saw. So every time, time we type here, we're gonna get a refresh of all the movies. But let's take a look at the data coming in here. So this movie with roles is view model dot movie. Let's see how that's defined. So if we come up here, we have movie is defined as a mutable state. That's just a bucket that we're throwing a value in. 
nothing here is automatically refreshing it. So we're not going to see that change immediately. If we come down to where we're actually doing that update, here he is here, we'll see that the only thing we're doing is calling repository update. So we're going to update it in the database, which will trigger the full list to, to be refreshed. But it will not be refreshing what we're seeing on the screen here. The thing with these text fields is they don't have any of their state of their own. They just take what you pass into them and they display it. So one thing we could try to do is force an update here and see if that actually makes it uh, work for us. So I can say movie equals expand movie like we were doing bound before here. Um, or I can just actually call the um, uh, select function to do that. So I'll call select and pass in the movie, which will end up triggering that expand. It'll go fetch it again. Let's try running that. And go into the movies, hit the transporter, edit it, and we'll start typing something there. Now notice that both of these are changing, the title up in the, in the toolbar and the title down here, because now what we're doing is we're refreshing that mutable state movie whenever we do some kind of an edit. When the movie is refreshed, it automatically gets passed down to movie edit screen, assuming movie edit screen is actually the thing that's active, and it refreshes everything that you're seeing on the screen there. So fairly nice. And let's see, whoops. That was not what I wanted to do. I wanted to click in here. Seems to be behaving a lot better than it used to. Um, one of the things that's a little bit problematic here is that sometimes if we, the user's typing too fast and actually ends up getting a little faster than the database update, the cursor won't be in the right spot or it'll actually miss characters that the user's typed in. So a slightly better way to do this would be to take internal state for that uh, the text that's being displayed on the screen. Let me show you how to do this. And this is generally what you're gonna wanna do. It uh, removes some issues. I'm having some luck here right now that it's actually working well. Normally you'll see some kind of odd behavior. So let's go back to our common and take a look at what we got inside here. So we have this value passed in for our text field that we pass directly through and that's cool. So that's, that is just a nice simple value coming in and we display it on the screen. And what we can do is we can set it up so that we use that as an initial value that's being passed inside here and then keep track of it internally. Now, the problem there, of course, is that if the data on the outside changes and you shift to something different, you're not going to see the value change here. So we probably don't want to do that. Let's go to the caller of this. So in the movie edit screen where we have our text fields. And what we'd like to do inside here is if we have the same movie with roles object, then, um, well, we'll just use him as a starter. Let's come in here and say var title by remember mutable state of um, oops, uh, movie with roles dot movie dot title. And what this is going to do for me is remember puts a little bucket inside of the tree that's representing our user interface. That bucket is holding a mutable state. So basically another little bucket. And this bucket can be changed because it's a mutable state bucket. And we're going to use this as the value that we display on the screen. And we're going to edit it and update it in addition to updating the movie with roles that gets passed in. So let's take a look at what we have here. These errors here are because we need to bring in some property delegation stuff. Remember that buy, whenever you say buy something, it's going to delegate to something else. Um, okay, good. So the other student made it in, okay. Um, when we say buy, we're going to uh, delegate the getter and setter to title. So if somebody actually looks at title, it'll delegate it to the getter that the buy takes care of. If they uh, try to change it, it's going to delegate to the setter for this. Well, the getter and the setter are defined as extension functions. We need to import them. So in this case, all we need to do is hit Alt Enter. And it gives you this option for import get value and mutable state of. 
boom, there we go. And we're going to have to do it a second time for the set value. And you hit Alt, I just hit Alt Enter there, and that was the only option. So it just went ahead and pulled it in. So we now have this bucket in the tree that's holding on to a bucket we can change. And I'm going to also put in here description, kind of like that. And now we have those. So we're going to change it so that the movie scaffold, instead of using movie roles movie title, we're just going to use title, which is going to, which is local. It doesn't have to go through database updates. So we're guaranteed that what we're going to see here is going to be updated much, much more quickly. And we'll do the same thing down here for this value that we're actually using in the field. And when we do our on value change, I want to say title equals it. So we're going to take whatever the changed value is and immediately make that the value that we're going to display. So this is going to provide much, much better update scenario. Unfortunately, we didn't see it in the example I ran here, but the way I had it written, a lot of the times you'll see some really weird behavior with where the caret ends up, as well as sometimes it will miss keystrokes that you type in. Uh, and that can be really bad. So we'll do the same thing for description down here. Boom. And we'll say in here, description equals it as well. And so now we should have a much nicer experience for the user. We may not really notice much when I run this example, but let's take a look at how it looks. So we're going to come into our movies list. Let's fix that transporter title there. Ooh, that's really gross when I made it random like that. And I'm going to just backspace on this. You gotta be careful because sometimes the keyboard gets ahead here. We'll just change it back to the transporter and then I'll come back out. Everything looks good there. Everything looks good in this list. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the transporter again. He looks good there. Let's actually choose something different. Let's go to Hobbs and Shaw and see if we can fix him up. And I'm going to come back out of here. And one of the bugs in Compose is back. Let me describe what I'm seeing because this might not be too obvious to you. When I come into Edit, if I come in here and I make some changes and then I hit Back, the first Back drops the keyboard, which is good. The second Back here, in this case, went out, which is really the behavior I want. But if I come in here and edit and move this back to just deleting things in the field, when I hit back, keyboard goes down, hit back a second time, nothing happened. Notice that the little uh, icon for the cursor disappeared. And then I can come back out. So this is a bug that they actually, uh, it was, it would have probably, it would be problematic a lot more often and they fixed it, I'm going to have to try to report this and see if we can get this fixed. Um, let's say text field, delete bug, went back. And I will report that and see if we can get that fixed. Um, so it looks like actually the behavior is working pretty well here. Um, unfortunately, there, there wasn't any visual bad behavior, just Trust me when I say if you don't do this, it uh, and if you wait for the database, there are times when sometimes the user's typing will outpace the actual database calls, uh, and that can be really bad effect. Multi uh, multi threaded programming can be a joy sometimes. So now we have this working like we expect, where we can actually see the edits. The edits are actually taking effect in the database. If I stop the application and then come back in again. I'll see the data in the database. Wait a second. So that looks okay. Let me stop it, run it again. It looks okay there. Let's edit one more time. Put some garbage in there, come out, and I'll go ahead and stop it and rerun it. Okay, we're seeing the right thing. 
mean, I must have typed some stuff and not realized it. So now we have our, our application is kind of behaving like we want, but we want to make it look a little bit nicer. There's a few things here that I don't like. One, when we first come in, we have this really ugly main screen that we don't want. We can use the movies as the main screen, and let the user just tab between them, and that should work out just fine. But we've got to deal with this reset database button because we currently don't have, if I just got rid of this, we wouldn't actually be able to reset the database. So what we'd like to do is put that reset database button up on the toolbar for each of these pages. So whether you're in ratings, movies, or actors, you can reset the database. And then we can get rid of this main screen here. Uh, so I'm gonna come over into here. And before I do that, I'm gonna enable Git. And then I'm gonna commit this just in case. I should have turned off the code analysis for the commit. It's a good thing that they do the code analysis, but I, I don't wanna do that in class here. Okay, so what we're gonna do is try to remove that main screen. So I'm gonna come back to where we had main screen. Let's find what code is actually doing that reset there. So we're just actually passing it in. I'm gonna cut that and delete my main screen. I'm not gonna run the safe delete because it, it's just gonna have some references that I'll have to clean up. And let's go back to our main activity. And we'll notice that there are a few issues here. Importing main screen doesn't work anymore. I'm just gonna get rid of that import. And then down here, when my state is main screen, I'm gonna to go to main screen. Well, let's kill that state too, because we don't want that state. I'm going to delete him. And now main screen can't be used as the default anymore. Let's change that to movies screen. And we'll make this be movies screen as well. So the view model looks okay. Back in our main activity, this whole block is a problem now. So what I wanna do is pass this same kind of on reset to each of the main list screens for us. So let's go to our actor screen. And I'm gonna pass in a on reset. Was that? There we go. And I'm going to do the same kind of thing in my movies screen and my ratings screen. So that'll at least let us pass in this lambda of what to do for each one of these guys. And let's take that on reset, get rid of the main screen stuff, and we will pass him in to each of these. So we now have that on reset available, but we have to add it to the toolbar so we can do something with it. So let's take a look at actor screen. We'll see an actor screen, he's calling movie scaffold, passing in an empty set of, uh, or an empty list of actions to put at the top. So we're gonna need to put that on reset action up at the top. Now, if we wanted to, we could just go ahead and put this as something that the base scaffold takes care of for us automatically, the movie scaffold, rather than having to explicitly pass in top actions. However, that would also affect the other ones that are for displaying movies and editing movies. So we really don't wanna do that. We wanna explicitly specify here that for the actor's screen, the movie's screen, and the ratings screen, we're going to uh, have actions. So we'll come in here and we're gonna say immutable list of, top action, and we need some kind of an icon for this. So I'm gonna say icon equals icons.default. Oh, maybe refresh. I think refresh might be pretty good. That gives you a little kind of circular icon there. And what else does he need? So he needs a content description ID and an on-click. So content description ID is going to be r.string.something. Let's go in the strings and set that up. And we're gonna say um, action 
refresh database. I'm going to say reset database, actually. And then back here, we'll say action reset database will be the text form. And then our action is going to be calling this on reset. So you can say on click equals on reset. Um, is that actually? Thought that said he was a suspend function. Yeah, he should be a suspend function. So why is it actually letting that work? Okay, so I'm gonna copy that top actions and let's go over to our movies screen. And we will replace top actions with that. And then make that on reset a suspend function. And then rating screen, we'll do the same thing. And now let's take a look at our mains here. So everything seems to look okay here. Um, this on reset, oh, I'm actually launching a coroutine, so he shouldn't be a uh, suspend function. Let me come back there, get rid of him. Why is top action a suspend function? That's interesting. Let's see if I break anything by doing that. So movies screen, I'm gonna get rid of him. Rating screen, I'm gonna get rid of him. And some imports to get rid of to clean things up. And let's see if that's gonna work. So I think we might actually also have to, did I change the starting screen in here? No, I'm getting it from the view models. That should be good. So let's try running this. Hopefully we're going to see it start on the movie screen and we should see the little reset button up on the toolbar. There we go. So there's our reset button now. If I hit that, notice how my movies changed back to the normal stuff. And on these other two screens, I also have that refresh button. So now we've actually simplified and improved our user interface somewhat here. Let's go ahead and commit that. I'm gonna say add reset and remove old start screen. Okay, so that should be good. And now we actually wanna to try to work with the list and make the list be a little better. All we've done right now is just have a column of uh, values to be displayed. And that's hugely inefficient. Let's take a look at that list screen real quick here. So we're gonna come back to list screen and we'll see that what he does is he's creating a column and then for each item in the list, so for each movie, for each actor, for each rating, whatever, we're going to put a text in that spot. This is very, very inefficient because if we had thousands of movies, we're going to instantiate a text instance in that tree for every single one of them. And it's gonna be very, very inefficient. So instead we wanna use a dynamic data structure here, something called a lazy column. And what the lazy column does for us is keep track of a list of things we wanna display, but only render the things that we really need for right now, the things that would take up some screen space. Anything that's off screen, it's not actually gonna add a node for. Uh, and that can make things much, much more efficient for us here. Okay. Um, oh, actually, one other thing I want to talk about before I start going into this detail. If we look at the movie edit screen, what we're doing right now is every time somebody types a character, we're saving this value in the database. And depending on what you're doing, and then we're actually refetching it from the database as well. Um, depending on what you're doing in your application, that could be very, very slow. Uh, and it could end up causing some, some problems in the application as far as uh, things keeping up or race conditions. Uh, so another alternative, and we're not gonna implement it here, but another alternative to this approach is instead of saving on every single click, 
we could put a couple icons on the toolbar. One of them would be a done icon. Usually you use a check mark for that. The other one would be a cancel icon and usually use an X icon for that. I believe the icon name is clear for that one, for that X. And by doing that, what you can do is the clear icon, all he would do is back out. He would just pop the stack to get back out of this application or to get out of the screen. The, uh, the done one would do this save here and then do the back. And that way you wouldn't have quite as much uh, chattiness between the database and the application. Um, the disadvantage there is if something happens and your application gets killed, you know, uh, one potential problem, maybe you have a bug in your application and it crashes, the user could lose data. By doing things this way, the user is not gonna lose any more than a character worth of data. Uh, and this is something that I did in some applications at my last job where we had some problems in the application that were really hard to track down and sometimes it would crash. And so to make sure the data wasn't lost, I took this approach. Uh, and it worked fast enough for what we were doing. Uh, but keep in mind, if you're doing some pretty complex data, it may be better to have a done cancel button there. Uh, but don't make that decision unless you see a performance problem. Okay, so list screen. Let's take a look at what this guy's gonna look like. And Let me see which way I want to approach this. So list screen is just putting a column up. So this is actually going to be embedded inside of a scaffold. Now, what I'd like to do here to make my life a little simpler is I would like to actually have something I'll call a list scaffold. And the list scaffold will include a call to the list screen, or sorry, the, the uh, movie scaffold passing in a list as its content. So the whole, the whole screen is basically list content is what we're going to use. So let's take a look in here. I'm going to say new file, list scaffold. And then inside here, I want a little composable function that's going to take all the parameters that were needed for my scaffold plus parameters that are going to be needed for a screen. And then I can manage all of this nicely. So we'll start with a composable function. And he's going to have a bunch of parameters. Let's call it, oops fun list scaffold. And then he's going to end up calling movie scaffold with a bunch of parameters. So let's take a look at what we need for our, our movie scaffold and how we're currently using it. So I go to my movies screen, who uses a movie scaffold. Here are the parameters that I'm going to be using that I need to pass in. So let's come back to my list scaffold. And, oh, that was actually specific movies one. I wanted the parameters. Uh, movies screen, there he, uh, where's movies? There we go. So I wanted the parameters up here. Let me copy them. And we're gonna come back over to our list scaffold. And those are the parameters I need to pass in to the movie scaffold. Uh, title is gonna have to come in here as well. And I'm passing him as an in, as a res there. No, he's a string. So it'll be a title. And then we're gonna have top actions will need to be passed in. I'm going to just have that be an empty immutable list for the moment. Current screen needs to be passed in. Um, that's actually not quite doing what I wanted it to do. So I'm calling my movie scaffold, passing these guys in. I think I actually wanted to pass. He's calling the list screen before. I need to pass the top actions. And I'm going to copy it from this other piece of code that I had over here. Um, yeah, those are the ones I want. See if I can get the right stuff inside here. And boom, something kind of like that. Whoops, this, yeah, that's where I wanted them. And let's bring in the immutable list there. That's better. 
And we have our screen targets and our on-screen select. That's better. These were things I was passing from the main activity before. <clears throat> so when we create a list scaffold, we're going to take all the data we're passing and just pass it to the movie scaffold. We're going to have something a little bit different for the top actions here uh, based on the screen that comes in. So if it's the movie screen, we can pass in something. Um, if we wanted to at this point, since these are the only ones that, since the only ones that have the reset button are the list screens, we could actually just wire that up inside here to create those actions for the reset and then not have to worry about setting them from the outside. I'm gonna keep them on the outside for right now in case we wanna add any extra actions. Okay, so now we have our movie scaffold there. We need to deal with setting up the list inside of here. And we do that using a lazy column. And the idea of the lazy column is he's going to get past a list of things that we want to display. And he's going to figure out which things are necessary to be on the screen for the user at this point. And those are the only things that he's actually going to create the constructs inside of the compose tree to display to the user. So it uh, makes things much, much more efficient. And we can do that by, pass it by uh, calling items. And inside of there, we say items equals something that we'll define in a moment. Key equals something that we'll define in a moment. And then give it the actual what we want to display for each individual node. So this is going to walk through each item in the list and the ones that are going to be visible. We're going to use this block to define what to put into the compose tree for us. Now that means that we need an items list and we need some way of getting a key for each of those items. This Lambda here is called for each item to get a key. And the reason the key is important is so that the lazy column can optimize itself. If you add and remove things, it can even animate those. So that uh, as things are adding and removing, it can make it disappear and then squish the rest of the items together. Or if something's added, it can move the items apart automatically and put it in. Um, so that's pretty nice there. Uh, but if you don't put the key, the only way that it can figure out which nodes were there before and thereafter is just their position in the list. And when you're adding or moving to the list, that's not a great way to do things because it can't tell which items it really needs to refresh. It pretty much has to refresh everything below the item that, that changed. So having a key is nice because then it can know, do I need to refresh a certain thing on the screen or not? So we need to be able to pass those in somehow. I want to have this list work for movies and for ratings and for actors. So I don't know what the type is. So I'm going to make that a generic on this list. And that's very similar to in, in Java. You can pass a generic on a function. And inside of here, let's pass in items, which is going to be an immutable list of T. And I want to use that immutable list so I can take advantage of, of uh, Jetpack Compose being able to uh, refresh this without having only when it's needed to be refreshed. And I'm going to come down here and say items equals items. And now I have to deal with that key. Key is going to be a function that's going to be able to take an individual item and return a key from it. So I'm going to say, let's call that get key. And he is going to take one of the items in the list of that type T, so it'll be either movie or, or rating or actor, and he's going to return a string. So the string key for it. And we'll say here key equals get key it. I think I can just say get key. Let's see. No, signature is slightly different. And let's see, make sure I bring in items. There he is. <clears throat> so now that's, let me just try that one more time because I thought I could just say get key here. Yeah, because the signature is the same. This Lambda here that key is getting passed, uh, passes in an item and returns a string, which is exactly the same signature as the function being passed in. Because of that, I can just say key equals get key. So items is going to walk through each of those, grab a key for each, 
and then use this to render that item on the screen. Now, I don't know how to render these items. I mean, these items could be a movie, it could be a, a, a rating, or it could be an actor. And I have no idea what the, the caller wants to use to render those. <clears throat> so the caller is going to have to pass in something to do that rendering. It's going to be a composable function. Let's actually call it uh, item content. And it's going to be a composable function that takes the item and then adds stuff to the tree. So he's not actually going to return anything. He's just going to emit items to the, uh, the Jetpack Compose tree there. So I can use that inside here. This guy here gets an item passed into him. And I can say item content, passing in the item. Poof, kind of like that. Now there's a couple little things here to, to watch out for that we need to do in addition. One, you see this modifier being passed in as to this get content here. The movie scaffold is going to be placing some stuff at the top, some stuff at the bottom, and then is going to use a modifier to tell you which area of the screen is yours for the content. So we really need to respect that by passing this modifier in to item content. So I'm going to add another parameter on here called modifier. And now we have a Lambda. Make sure when you import this, you pick the one that is from Android X Compose UE. Don't pick the Java ones or things will not work. We now have a Lambda here that takes two parameters. So we can no longer just use item here because you know there's more than one parameter. Or if we blank that out, we can't use it because it will not be defined. There are two parameters being passed into this guy. I'm sorry, that was that there. Um, the caller here is going to have to define that, not down here. So we're going to pass in item, and we're also going to pass in the modifier up here. I'm going to go ahead and say content modifier, just to give it a name, just so it's a little more obvious what's going on. So now we're passing information to the composable that's passed into us that's going to be drawing each of those rows, saying how to actually draw it. Now, when I'm drawing something in a list, I like to use a card. And a card is a component that has rounded corners. It's a rectangle with rounded corners, and it looks a little bit raised. So I'm going to go ahead and have this list scaffold take care of that so that the caller doesn't have to define the card. I can take care of that common, fun that common look right here. So I'm going to say card. And let's make sure we import him. And let's see what all he needs. So we're going to, an elevation will tell it how far up it looks like it's actually floating. And I can pass a modifier into him. Now, in this particular case, I could just go ahead and take that content modifier and pass it in at the card level now and not have to pass it in here. Um, we're going to leave a modifier here for a moment. Um, I'm just going to say, instead of content modifier, just a default modifier. who doesn't really do anything. We'll just use them as a placeholder. Later on, I'm going to have to adjust what the item content does. But for now, I can just say modifier equals content modifier on the card. And then the card will know the spot that he's supposed to be in there. Oh, I'm sorry. The modifier should be at the at the, the column level. I think I'm awake now. So the lazy column is the entire content area. So we're just going to use that content modifier to say where the lazy column exists. So my apologies. I put the wrong thing there. We do want to have a modifier in here, though. I'm going to say padding 8.dp. And this is just going to keep some spacing around the content inside here. So we have our card. Well, it's a space. It's facing around the card. Um, the card also has a shape, which by default is a rounded rectangle, a background color, which is going to show what color the background of the card is. Content color is the text that's on top of that. Um, what kind of border you want on them, and then the actual. Uh, content, which we have down here. So this should create a nice little card for us with 8DP padding around it, um, and then display some item content here. Now we could also make this be a modifier.padding8 as well. 
So now the item content will automatically be indented inside the card. So it'll have a little bit of spacing inside of it. And that way the, the caller doesn't really have to do anything other than say, use the modifier that's passed to me. So this is a fairly simple movie scaffold using a lazy column. And we can pass in what we need to the list scaffold to be displayed on the screen. Let's try doing this with the movies page. So movies screen here. And we're going to change this instead of being movie scaffold. We're going to make it be a list scaffold who uses a movie scaffold under the covers. And then we're going to have all these guys passed in like we did before. And we just need to define items and get key. So we saw here when we did the list screen before, we passed in movies as the items. So I can say items equals movies. But notice how movies here is a normal list. It's not an immutable list like we said we wanted inside our list scaffold. So I'm going to change this one to be an immutable list. So now movies is OK. And then we need to define what get key is going to do for us. So get key is going to take a movie and a, uh, actually, no, it's just a movie. It's all he returns. And returns movie.id. I believe that's right. There we go. So the function we're going to use to compute the key is going to be just get the ID off the movie that was passed in. And so no value passed for item content. Let's go ahead and define that. We could make this a parameter here, or we could just use the lambda outside. Let's just use the lambda outside. And item content is a composable that takes the movie and a modifier. So we have to put these up here, movie and modifier. Because there's not exactly one parameter, we have to list them. We have to give them names. We can't use it. So to define that, we need to have some kind of an element that we're going to display uh, the movie title. So we can just use a text for that and say text equals movie dot title modifier. Whoops equals modifier. So we'll let him do all the placing for us. And there we go. Now I can get rid of this old movie scaffold. And hopefully the movie screen will work, but look a little nicer now. So let's go ahead and run it. And whoops, I now have to fix up the call because here, movies is a list of movies. Let's take a look at where he's defined. We're grabbing from the view model, the movies flow, which is a flow of list movie. So we need to be able to convert that into an immutable list. Because right now, anytime I ask about movies, I get a list of movies. I don't have an immutable list. So let's go take a look in the view model at this guy. We're going to the repository, we're getting a movies flow. That is a flow of list movie. We need to convert that into a mutable list. So I'm going to use a map on this. And what map is going to do is going to take each item before it emits it and convert it to something else. So movies flow is now going to be a special flow that takes the movies flow here the, from the repository and converts each thing that's been emitted. So to do that conversion, I'm just going to say, immutable list, it. I'm just wrapping that list in an immutable list there. So now if I go back to my main activity, movies flow is now a flow of immutable lists coming out of here. And then movies over here, well, that's going to just need to be, oh, the reason this is saying list here is because my initial value is empty list. And the only commonality between empty list and this immutable list is the list interface. So this needs to change to a empty immutable list. And now if I take a look at movies, it knows the type is immutable list. So now everything else looks like it's OK in there for passing it down. Let's go ahead and try running it again.
And now we have a movie list here. A few little issues on this. Um, the uh, the backgrounds, it, we didn't specify the elevation on here, I think, because it, it just looks like the border is just directly drawn and that'll help. But also notice how the borders are ending a little, little sooner. We need to expand them all the way across. So we'll take a look at our list scaffold here. And in our card, let's give it an elevation. I'll just use 8.dp. Eight or four tend to look pretty good, sometimes six. You just have to kind of play with it to see what you like. And inside here, I'm calling item content with padding eight. So you can see that there's padding inside the card, but I need to make this card actually expand. So with my modifier here, I'm gonna say, give me padding eight, and then I'm gonna say, fill max width. And that should make the card be a little wider. That's much better. And now we can see more pronounced shadows because of that eight. If I change the eight to a four, now in this case, you notice how it updated right away. Sometimes Android Studio will be able to do that. It depends on the type of edit you did. Um, the four actually looks pretty good, I think. So it's enough of a shadow to actually see it, uh, but it's not too much. If I made this like 20 or something, then you get nothing but shadow all over the place. Four seems to be pretty good on the way this looks there. So now we have a pretty nice looking list of movies here. Let's do the same thing for our uh, actors and our ratings. So we have our list scaffold calling that, our movies screen is calling list scaffold. I'm gonna go ahead and just copy this list scaffold and go to my actors screen. And we'll need to change a few things here. And refresh database we want there as well. Current screen, la 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 la. This one needs to become actors. This one's going to be actor to actor ID. This one's going to be actor. And we're going to say actor.name. And this needs to be an immutable list again. And that looks pretty good. Let's just scan here, just make sure there's nothing else that looks like it's movie. That looks good. And I should be able to just delete the rest of this now. And we'll do the same kind of thing for the ratings. And let's find the ratings string. And now it's gonna be ratings. And we're gonna say rating, rating ID, rating, and then rating that name. And then we're gonna make this an immutable list again. And he looks good now. Can get rid of this guy. And now we're just going to have to clean up the ratings and the actors in the view model, similarly to what we did for the movies flow here. So I'm going to take this same map code and put it after each of these other ones so that whatever we get from the repository, we're going to convert from a list into an immutable list. And let's see how that looks. Case. So this guy, same kind of thing with the empty immutable list. I gotta fix those two. And now we should be good. And there's our movies, our ratings, and our actors. That looks much, much nicer. So I'm gonna go ahead and commit what we have at this stage. And now nothing actually is using this list screen anymore. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that list screen. Let's just run it just to make sure that everything's fine. I'm pretty sure nothing was using it. And now we're seeing our new and improved list screens on these guys. 
you commit him as well. Use lazy column. And we'll commit that. And so far, so good. Any questions so far? <clears throat> Now, what else can we or should we want to do with a list? Right now in these things, if I click on them, notice that nothing's happening. I forgot to put over the code that handles that click. And if I had paid attention to the warning that came up down there, it would have told me that I wasn't using the select parameter passed in there. So let's fix him up. So we actually still can keep our, our functionality. So when I go to my movies screen, you'll notice that this select parameter is not currently being used. He's the one that I want to use when something gets clicked. So I need to have my list allow me to click on a card and do something about it. Let's go to our list scaffold. And we'll say on open, we'll say. Um, actually, let's call this just on click. On item click. And we're going to pass in the item. And whoever's calling it can just do something. We don't need a value back from them. So I need to put on item click somewhere. If we put it in the card, then that means that anytime you click anywhere in the card, it'll activate that click. And that sounds like that's a pretty good way to go about this. So let's take a look at this guy here and say dot clickable. And we'll pass in on click, on item click, passing in the item that was clicked. And that should give us that link. We now need to make sure that we're passing in that on item click from the movie screen and the rating screen and the actor screen. So inside here, I'll say on item click equals select. Because on item click requires the same signature as select up here, we can just use an equals. If it didn't require the same signature, we'd have to put it in a lambda. So for example, in the list scaffold here, on item click takes an item and does something with it, but doesn't return anything. But clickable takes nothing. So if you take a look at the on, oops, the on click parameter here, we'll see that it doesn't have any parameters. So we had to use a Lambda in this case. Let's go back over from movies. Let's go to actors. And we can do the same kind of thing here on click. On item click equals select. And then we'll do the same thing in ratings. Like that. And now when we run this, we should see it respond to clicking on the cards. So I'll click on Transporter 2, boom, I have my details there. Click on Edit, I can now edit it, add some stuff there, come back. I see the changes, and I see the changes in the list there. So, so far, so good. We'll say Respond to Clicks. OK, so. <clears throat> Now let's do something a little bit more interesting with these, these lists. Um, right now, clicking just goes someplace, and that's cool. But what if we wanted to delete movies or delete actors or delete ratings? It'd be nice to have some way to do that. If we can come up with a way to select these and show the selection on the screen and change the toolbar when something's selected, we could put a different icon up there, like a trash can icon, for example. So let's think about how we can deal with the selection in here. And right now, anytime I click, it immediately goes someplace. So clicking by itself isn't gonna work for selecting because it would have two meanings and we can only really have one meaning here. One approach that we could use is something called a long press. So if I hold and then let go, in this case, since I don't have anything defined for it, it defaults back to a normal click. But if I did a long press, we could use that to select things. Um, and that's kind of a standard in Android to do long presses. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those things that isn't really super well documented. There's not really a way for the user to know that. So there's other approaches that people do. You know, we can support the long press, but we can also do some other stuff here. One approach is to put some icons in front of each of these guys. Whoops. 
And if you click on the icon, the icon causes a toggle. And that can be super useful. So let's try that approach. We're going to use uh, a different icon for each of these things, either a little movie icon, an actor icon, or something for the rating, You know, whatever we define down here for these guys. Let's take a look on our list scaffold. And what I'd like to do is, first of all, put the icons on there. So let's pass in a icon that we want to use. I'm going to use an image vector again. And I'm going to modify the contents of my card here to have the icon and then the item content. So let's say icon. I'm going to pick the image vector one. And we need a content description for it. I'm going to say r dot, uh, actually, string resource, r dot string dot, we'll create a new guy for him. And note that the R class isn't directly found. Because we're underneath this screens package, it doesn't see R. R is the whatever the default package is for the entire application. It generates that R file inside there. So com Java Dude Movies 2 R, representing all of the content inside the resources directory. So in this case, we're going to need to import him. I'm going to do a control space. And I'm going to have to go all the way up to the top here. Whoops, where is he? Make sure we have com Java Dude movies. Boom. And now we can go into that strings file and choose something here. So let's say click to select. I'll come back over here and I can change that to be click to select because that's what this guy is doing. And we can define a modifier for him. And we will make him have a specific size. So I'm going to say size 48.dp. And 48dp is a good size for a button. It's about the size of the average thumb. And we'll give him a padding 8.dp inside there. And let's see, then we have the image vector, the icon, that's good. Now we need to actually define the clicking. And note that we have a clickable at the card level. And at the icon level, we have a clickable. Wherever the click is, it's going to take a look for the most nested thing at that level to see how to handle the click. So in this case, the click inside the icon will override the click inside the card. So if this icon is clicked, then I want to uh, do some kind of a select action here. So I'm going to toggle a selection. So let's add in a on toggle select. And I'm just going to have it keep track of the ID of something to see if it's selected or not. Well, do I want to do that or do I want to do the, um, no, I'm just going to do that rather than have uh, the full object kind of held around. So he's going to take in a string and do something with it. Now, that also means that we probably want to have some kind of structure to tell us is something selected or not. So I can have selections or selected IDs, let's call it, which is going to be an immutable set, which we need to define, of strings for the IDs. So let's define that immutable set. I'm going to go where immutable list is defined. And we will do the same kind of thing here, just changing everything to say set. And it's going to be a mutable set of. And you want it to be a mutable set instead of list coming out. Empty immutable set around an empty set. And Oh, that needs to be set of. There we go. So now we have a nice little immutable set, very similar to our immutable list. There we go. So we now have selected IDs and on toggle select. So let's actually deal with the toggling select. When you click something, we're going to call on toggle select for 
the ID of the thing that uh, we're, we're clicking on. So we're going to have to uh, call get key on it to fetch that. So we'll say get key for the item. Whenever we click it, we're going to call on toggle select. So far, so good. But how do we want to display the selection? Uh, the, the most common way to deal with selection is to change the background color. What we've seen so far in here is the background color is just this whitish color. That's called the surface color that's, that's uh, pulled from the theme. Our theme is defined underneath this UE theme package. And if we take a look, we're going to see that it says we have a couple color palettes defined, a dark color palette and a light color palette. These are referencing colors defined here. So we just have some colors. This is where we could change which type of colors are being used in the theme. And it's defining certain slots for them. So a primary one, a primary variant, and a secondary color. We're going to be using the secondary color as the selection. And then if we take a look here, he's saying if I have a dark theme, use the dark palette, otherwise use a light palette. And then he creates this theme object that puts the colors in, puts the typography, which comes from the type uh, file here, shapes, which comes from the shape file, and so on. And when you use a material theme, you can you pass in whatever content you want to display in the application. We see that up in the main activity. There he is. When we're setting the content, we have Movies 2 theme wrapping everything inside of here. And so it's using that theme for all the colors and all the typography for everything inside of him. So we can just reference the theme to be able to get stuff out of it. So let's take a look back here. This is inside of our movie scaffold. And I'd like to change that card's background color. So I'm going to say background color equals something. And we need to pull out the right color based on if something's selected. So we can take a look at the ID. And if the ID is inside selected IDs, we're going to use a selection color. Otherwise, we're just going to use the default surface color there. So hmm, I'm going to call get key in two places here. Let's just call it in one. I'm going to put it up here and say val key equals that. And then I can down here just say key and then use that same guy to do my lookup here. So the background color is going to be if um, I, uh, key in selected IDs, then we'll use material theme dot colors dot uh, secondary is what I wanted to use. Else, we're going to use the normal surface color there. And so that now gives us a primary color to use for the background. Let's take a look at what card does behind the scenes, though. Notice how content color has a default value. Because we specified background color, he can compute which color to use based on that background color. So he'll come up with a contrasting color that will be visible on top of there. And you don't have to do the work for that. And that's really super nice. Uh, there are a bunch of, there's a, a nice uh, color chooser at the material design site, which will help you choose legible colors. This takes care of it automatically for you. So we're just setting our background color based on our selection. And we're going to toggle our selection. Let's just see if that much works to be able to keep track of it. Well, we need to change how this thing is called now. We have these two guys being passed in. Let's go back to movies. I'll do ratings first as long as he's at the bottom. I'm going to pass those in as parameters and then pass them down. So on toggle select equals on toggle select and selected IDs equals selected IDs. And what is he unhappy about? There's still something missing. Um, item content is down there at the bottom. 
Hmm. Did I change the way that that is being used? Oh, this is the order of these guys. I need to pass the icon in as well. That's better. So we'll pass the icon in and we can say icon equals icon. And let's see, this guy, he's the rating screen. Well, we actually don't have to pass the icon in here. We can define it because we know we're the rating screen. So we're gonna say images, uh, the icons dot default dot, and what did we use for the rating icon? That would be probably up at the main activity level. Find icons, nope. Where do we define that? I'm just gonna do a search at the top level here. I'm gonna say find in files and say icons dot. And let's see where we define that. So it looks like emergency movie in person. And we use those in the view model. Okay, so emergency, uh, emergency movie in person are what we're using. So for the rating screen, we're gonna use emergency just like we did before. And then for, let's copy those three. We just did our ratings, let's go to our movies. Paste these new ones in there that we need. Oh, we already had select. And, oh, I copied the wrong ones, didn't I? Oh, because I don't need the icon, that's right, okay. So the icon down here, we'll say icon equals icons.default.movie. And then we also needed to pass in on toggle select equals on toggle select and selected IDs equals selected IDs. So now he looks happy. And now we'll go up to our actor screen and do the same thing. So you'll notice what happens is these parameter lists get longer and longer. <clears throat> and uh, later on, we'll do a little refactoring on this to kind of group some of these together. So we'll notice that there's some that are definitely related to selection. We could move those together into an object that has common handling for it and then pass that down instead of having to pass all these individual pieces. It can just make things a little bit cleaner to read. So we'll come in here and on toggle select equals on toggle select and selected IDs equals, oops, what did I hit? There we go. And then icon equals oh, icons dot default dot person is what I use, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So those are pretty good. Now we got to roll up to the callers of all this in main activity. And we'll see that there's a few spots that are unhappy. So in here, we're not passing in the, um, whoops, we'll float down to the end here. We're not passing in on toggle select um, or select. Now this down here was the select function. Let's see what's in there now. I need to move that select function back to the bottom. Remember the last Lambda in there is the one that's outside. So let's see, that's actors, movies. Let's make sure that that Lambda is down there. And then ratings. That'll fix that part of it up. And so now we actually just have nothing passed for on toggle select or selected IDs. So we need to keep track of these IDs somewhere. And we could do that in the view model to say what's selected. We could do it inside the composable functions, but if we do it in the composable functions, we're gonna lose that anytime the activity needs to be recreated. We could use remember savable, which is a special version of remember that saves it off for when you sw swap in and out of the application or, or change configurations, um, but it's kind of heavyweight. Having it in the view model here kind of makes sense to keep track of what's selected. So let's do it in the view model. We're gonna need three 
of these immutable sets to keep track of. And I want to do them kind of similar to what we did up here. Let's say selected actors. And it's going to be a bucket that's going to hold on to an immutable set of string. So we're just our selected actor IDs. Let me actually make that a little more explicit. So you're going to have a mutable state of this immutable set. And we're going to pass in an empty set for it. Empty immutable set. Again, a private setter. We don't want people to modify that directly outside of here. We'll do the same kind of thing with the movie IDs and the rating IDs. So now we have the data that we're keeping track of here. We can pass these in as that set and provide ways to modify them. So let's provide a couple functions to do this. Let's say fun toggle selected ID. And we'll pass in um, our selected uh, movie ID. And we're going to pass in the ID. And then we're going to need to say selected movie IDs equals selected movie IDs minus ID. Uh, well, actually, it depends on if it's in there or not. So let's say if ID in selected movie IDs. Else. We'll add it. And then we can actually promote this variable assignment outside of the if, because the if is an expression. It's going to hit Alt Enter on there. And well, actually, he's giving a different option there. I want to actually move this up like that. We have a little issue here. We don't have any type of operator that will uh, return an immutable set for plus or minus. What's happening here is because an immutable set is a set, set defines the minus operator, also defines the plus operator. So whenever we use this minus operator, it's returning the set version of that. So the type is just off there. What we need to do is, is make sure that we're going to have an immutable set at the end of this. So let's take a look at our immutable set. And we're going to uh, define a uh, operator fun plus taking in an item of the type T. And the return value is going to be a new immutable set wrapped around the base set that we had plus the item. And then we can do the same kind of thing for minus. And boom, we now can directly work at the immutable set level with a plus or minus and get an immutable set back instead of just a normal set. Um, this is how you define operator overloads in Kotlin. Use them minimally. Only use them for things that truly make sense. And in this case, because the set already had those, we're just basically doing the same thing that the, the core libraries did for us. Now, if we come back, we'll see that those work just fine. And we can just repeat this for the other two things. So actors and And then rating IDs. So they kind of like that. And if you're looking at this and saying to yourself, you know, that seems kind of wasteful to have all that code repeated, when really what we're doing is we're taking a set and adding or removing something from it, we can actually create a helper function here. And we'll just say toggle um, selection ID. And we'll pass in, 
actually we can just make the set outside of here. So we'll say immutable set of T, actually it's string, because it's always a string. And I will say toggle selection ID. And we will say if ID in this, because we're passing in the set as a receiver, we just refer to it as this. I'm going to say this minus ID or this plus ID. And then these guys here can just become um, selected movie IDs equals selected movie IDs dot toggle selection ID, ID. And, oh, we're not returning it. There, now we're happy. And so that's where we're going to save a little bit of code here. And by using the extension function here, it becomes pretty readable too. Kind of like that. There we go. So reuse, it's nice. Um, and I'll change this to be an equals with the single expression that we have there rather than putting a return in front of it. Okay, so that gives us some little functions that allow us to modify the data. We have these data available outside. I can I come back to the main activity and actually use it? So in our actor screen, we need selected IDs and select. So selected IDs is going to be view model dot selected. This is what actors, yes, selected actor IDs. And on toggle select is going to be view model. Uh, let's see, toggle selected actor ID, just like that. The function reference here works because this guy's signature is the same as the signature needed. Alternatively, I could have written this as that, and life's peachy. Either one is perfectly acceptable. I, I've gotten in the habit of liking the uh, function references when it's the same signature. Um, whichever way you feel comfortable, you don't have to do it with the function references if you're not comfortable with it. We'll do the same thing for these other guys. So for movies, going to be selected movie IDs. And then for ratings, oops, selected ratings IDs and rating ID there, poof. So I think we're going to have something here that should work. Let's take a look. If this works, we should see uh, when you click on an item, it should become selected and you should see its background turn blue. So we have a movie. Whoops. Wow, I really messed that one up. So this layout is a little bit messed up. Let's take a look at it. And you'll notice that what I did here is I have a card and inside it, I have an icon and an item content. I didn't specify a layout. I want to put these in a row so I have the icon followed by the item content to its side. That's like the 60th time I've done this in my life. So let's see what this is going to look like. We're going to have a row and I'm going to move these guys in just like that. And what we're going to want to do is the icon takes up a fixed amount of space. We said size 48 dp. We want this item here to take up the rest of the space in the row. To do that inside of a row, we're just gonna add a weight to that guy. Now in this particular case, the weight can be anything you want it to be, any number, because we only have one thing inside this row that specifies a weight. If you had more than one thing, let's say you had a name and a first name and a last name, and maybe you wanted to take up the exact amount of space, you'd specify the same number for weights for both of those guys, the first name and the last name. If you wanted one of them to be twice as much as the other, you'd specify a number that's twice as much there. So maybe the first one would be 2F, the second one would be 1F. 
And this, this allows you to distribute remaining space. So in this particular layout, icon doesn't specify a weight. So pie weight for everything. Uh, that would be amusing. You could do that too. Um, you know, it'll be for some approximation of pi that they defined. Um, so the uh, the icon here is taking up fixed space. If you had other things taking up fixed space, they get accounted for first. And then whatever space is left over, that's what's divided up using these weights. So in this particular case, we have the icon with a fixed size and the item content takes up the remaining space. Let's see if that fixes things up for us. That's much better. And if we look at ratings, we're going to see the ratings. Looks like tomatoes. And actors, we have the actor, actor icons. Now, there's a little bit of a gotcha here. You notice how they don't quite seem to be lined up right? It'd be really nice to have the alignment so that the center of the text matches the center of that uh, icon. And we can specify that in here. So I can remember which thing it was. Uh, vertical alignment. So vertical alignment equals alignment dot center vertically. And let's see how that looks. That's much better. So you see how they line up nicely? And then the actors, they look centered better. And this, and it's little things like this that are going to make, you know, add some nice polish to your application. I'm not the best user interface designer, but there's like some little things like this that I can deal with. Uh, normally, I'd want to have a, a really good UX designer come along and give me a design to follow. And I would, you know, get down to the pixel level to specify gaps and things like that. Um, but this looks pretty decent. Now, let's see if it actually does what we want. When we click anywhere except the icon, we go to the, the thing that we wanted. If I click on the icon, boom, it gets selected. And we'll do the same thing here, same thing there, same thing there. Um, if I change the background instead of being the secondary, which not sure I really like that secondary color there, but that's the default for some reason. Um, instead of using secondary, if I change that to be primary, and let's try running it again. When I click on it, notice how the text changed to white and the icon changed to white. So that's what that uh, little function was doing for us inside card, where it was calling content color for. Note that it's computing a color that's actually going to be readable against that background. And I think I'm going to leave it as the primary color. I think that looks a little bit nicer. Um, if I click on another one of these, he selects it and so on and so on. So I got all these guys selected. However, if I click in the middle of something here, boom, it actually takes me out. And I may want to disable that when I actually have stuff selected. Or maybe I say that if something's selected and you click, I just treat it as selecting something else. So we can come into here and let's see. So we have the selected IDs coming in. If the selected IDs is empty, clicking in the middle of something will go there. If it's not empty, clicking there will actually toggle it. So let's find we have clickable on item click. Let's change this to say if selected IDs is not empty, then I'm going to do a on toggle select, passing in item dot ID. Or actually, I just key I had right. Yeah, else we'll do this guy. And so this will do two things. One, it won't drop you out of the select mode unexpectedly in case you just slightly miss the icon. Um, and it just makes it easier to select more things once you selected the first one. So let's see how that looks. And so if I click inside something, it comes out. If I click an icon and then click inside something, now it's just toggling these guys. That's a little bit more friendly. We could also add the long click support in here so that if you long click, it'll start selection mode for us as well. Let's see if I can get that. Is it long click or something like that? I, boy, it's been a little while since I've done this. Um, no, I don't see it there. I'm gonna have to look up how to do that. I don't do that very often. Um, 
I think I may have to change how the click works there because we may have to actually use the pointer input. instead and then say um, oh what was the I'll have to look it up just to, to double check but I'm pretty sure there's a uh, gesture detector that I have yeah detect tap gestures and then we can pass in there's long press and tap inside there. That's how it was. Let's try that real quick. So we'll say on long press, we're going to do something on tap. Now the difference between tap and um, uh, press, press is only the down uh, action when the user puts the finger down. Tap is down and then let go to actually do something. Um, we could do it either way, uh, but let's take a look at, let's do it this way here. We'll, we'll put him up in on tap. And then in long press, long press is always going to toggle select. Kind of like that. Now let's see if that does what I think I want it to do. And this would be a more complete way of handling the selection. So single select click works fine. Long press selects, long press still selects, long press still unselects. And if I tap, whoops, maybe I need to change that to a press. Let's try that again. Oh, uh, now I lost that. On toggle select key. Well, that's gonna definitely have to be a tap then because of the way that's behaving. Let's rerun. So it's not empty, toggle select, otherwise do an item click. Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is actually, I'm glad I did this because it, it demonstrates a, a, a problem here. What's happening? When I call this dot pointer input, notice I'm passing in unit here. This is basically saying I don't care if anything changes. At that point, I define these detect gestures and he actually captures the value of selected IDs. So at that point, selected IDs is kind of carved in stone. Because I want to actually look at it and say uh, when it's changed, I want to put that in as a key up here. So I say selected IDs. And what this will do is it'll say redefine my pointer input handling anytime the selected IDs changes. And that will make sure that this guy is actually seen as opposed to captured inside there. This is one of the few spots in Compose that this is going to happen to you. Uh, I haven't, I'm trying to remember if I've seen other ones, but this one caused me a lot of grief a while back. Uh, this should work now. So we're saying define pointer input handling based on any time selected ID changes. So now if I do this, this should work just fine. So there's a select, tap, tap, tap. When I unselect things, boom. Now it comes back there. If I long press, I go to select mode, tap, tap. I can unselect things and so forth. And if I tap, now I'm going back out there again. So there we go. So that's working good. So let's go ahead and take a break. And then what we'll do after the break is we're actually going to react to these selections. We're going to change our toolbar at the top to give us a delete button. So we can actually delete items from this application. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started again. Can everybody hear me? Hello, hello. Let me do the chat here. Can you hear me? 
I just want to double check before I keep moving on. Hello, 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 testing. Can you give me a thumbs up or say something if you can hear me? Or in the chat, just say, yep. I can hear you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make sure. Never know what's going to happen after I mute and unmute with Zoom. Okay. So uh, what we want to do next is actually do something when the, the items are selected. So we're going to create an alternative uh, a toolbar up at the top. And the alternative toolbar is going to show the number of items that are selected, as well as have a little back arrow to, to unselect everything. And it'll have a trash can on it. So uh, let's take a look at what we can do here. Right now, we have a single toolbar that's coming in our movie scaffold. So we have this top app bar that we created. And he has this title and some actions in there. And we'd like to be able to make that be uh, uh, swap outable. So we can have either the uh, uh, use a, um, a contextual top bar, which would be if things are selected, I show something different, or the normal top bar. So what I'm going to do is pass in uh, information about what's selected. So in the movie scaffold, we can pass in here saying, num selected which is just an integer and we're going to use that to decide which type of toolbar to display so i'm going to come up here i'm going to say val top bar equals if num selected is zero else something else so then when so when there's nothing selected we're going to use the normal toolbar so i'm going to take everything that we have here and put him there. And let's see, I don't want to do it there. Yeah, that's good. So we're defining that. And then we're also going to have an alternative view of this one. And the title is just going to be the number of items there. So the text is going to be num item, num selected to string. And the actions, we're only gonna have the one action for deleting. So come in here, we'll say for icon button, on click is going to be called uh, delete. So we need a function here on delete, pass him in. And let's make him a suspend function so that he can actually call the deletion stuff behind the scenes. So we'll launch on dispatchers IO and we will just call, whoops, let's actually make sure I'm editing the right one, on delete. The icon is going to be icons.default. Is it trash or it must be delete? There we go. And the content description is going to be r.string. Let's pull in the right r first. I always overshoot. There we go. And let's go to our strings. We're going to add in a delete selected items. Just like that. And then this guy, we will put in the delete selected items. And that should be pretty good. So we just have the single action once things are selected. Now, there's one other thing we want to do. I'm going to provide a navigation icon.
which is going to be an icon. <coughs> Excuse me. And we'll say image vector equals icons dot default dot. Oh, which one was it? Back arrow or something like that. Arrow back. That was it. This is one of those ones I looked at for I don't know how long to figure out which icon to use. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I, I kept using like arrow left and left this and and none of them looked right, but it was actually arrow back is the name of the one we want to use here. So the content description here is going to be a string resource. R dot string dot. Let's add something else in there. And we'll say clear selected items. Just like that. And we need to handle the click on him. So modifier. Oh, I need a comma. That's what the problem is there. Let's do an on click. Let's first of all do a size. And then we'll do a clickable. And when he's clicked, we're going to call on clear selections. So let's pass him in as well. Let's actually rename this one to be, well, first of all, let's put this in on clear selections. And we'll make this be on delete. I'm going to rename him to selections. And that should be pretty good there. Um, oh, I need to do my, well, he doesn't have to be a suspend function. Let's make him not suspend because he's not doing anything in the background. Boop. And I think we should be in pretty good shape there. So if we pass in this num selected, we'll get a different toolbar if it's non-zero and then we'll handle the deletions as well. So let me copy them. And everywhere that he's called, so rating screen. Oh, it's going to list scaffold first. So list scaffold, let's pass in. We need num selected, which we can just get from selected ID, so we don't need that passed in. And then these two parameters. So we'll say num selected equals selected IDs dot size on delete equals on delete selections. Ah, okay, thank you. And on clear equals on clear. There we go. So it'll pass those along. Let's see about those two guys. So go to our rating screen should now be broken. And we're gonna pass those along. And on delete selections is on delete selections. And then we'll go to our movie screen and do the same kind of thing. Oh, I didn't pass in the num selected. Oh no, it, it, it pulls it out of there, that's right. That one's okay. So then here, let's add in on delete selections is on delete selections, on clear selections is on clear selections. And then we'll go to our actors. And we'll pass in on clear selections is on clear selections, on delete selections is on delete selections. And now we need to tweak it in the main activity. So we're going to need to have the, uh, uh, depending on which screen we're on, we're going to delete different uh, selections in, from the view model. So if we go to the view model, let's add in a suspend fun, delete selected actors. 
And inside him, he's going to need to go to the repository and say, oh, I don't have any delete in there yet, do I? So let's go into the repository and add some delete functionality. And I'm going to go ahead and add, while I'm in here, just add in the update for actors and uh, rating. Not currently using them, but that would be kind of a next step to add in. And so for delete, we're going to want to pass in, we can either do single movies or a list of them. I'm going to make this a var arg so that we can pass in a list of them. And actually, we can just make it a list. It'll be much easier to deal with. And then this is going to be actor and rating. And what is he not like there? Oh, because it's a list here in Java and also in Kotlin, the type of the list gets erased. So I'm actually going to have to call this, uh, let's make it be, so delete movies. Delete actors, delete ratings. There we go. And so then these ones we need to define in the actual implementation. So the movie database repository. And we're going to need to put an override in front of each. And then we can actually have the real logic happen. So let's see what happens here. So delete movies, we're gonna call dbdow delete, passing in the movies. So we're gonna say star movies. But I'll probably have to convert that to an array. The whole, the fun of dealing with uh, varying length argument lists. So I'm gonna say movies dot two typed array, which is gonna create an array of movies. And then we're gonna use the spread operator to just use them as though I had made them comma separated and type that in by hand. So not the most fun thing to, to write there, um, but it's a little bit safer type-wise than the way Java does varying length arg list. There we go. So now we have that. And what is unhappy up here? Oh, the other updates. Okay, so I gotta put those in. So we're gonna have update. You know, actually, let me do it this way. And then I can copy these guys in. There, now he's happy. Okay, so he's done, the repository's done, the view model. We now need to actually say, delete actors, and I can pass in, oh, um, so the only thing we have here is we have the selected IDs, and we would either have to go and look up all the items for it, and then pass it in delete actors, or change our way of dealing with the database to delete by ID, which would probably be a little bit better way of doing it here. So let's do that. Let's come into a repository. Let's say by IDs. And we'll make this movie ID. Because I hate looking up things just to delete them. Just feels like a waste. And let's go to our movie database repository. We'll fix these guys up. Delete movies by IDs. That's going to be movie IDs. Oh, I need to change the type to strings as well. 
actor IDs and rating IDs. And these are all going to be lists of strings. Do -do 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 -do. And IDs, IDs, whoops. One too many S's there. And let's come back to him. And those are all list strings, IDs, that's good. Oh, I wanted to move to repository. Okay, better so far. So now we need to be able to delete by ID for each of these guys. To do that in our DAO, right now we can pass in the actual objects to delete, which is good if you have a handle on a single object and want to delete it. Um, but if we want to actually delete by an ID, we're going to do something kind of similar to what we did here. Obviously, we don't want to clear everything, but what we can do is say, delete movies by IDs. And we're going to pass in that list of strings. And then we'll say delete from movie where ID in colon IDs, just like that. And so this will replace the list of IDs comma separated inside the squeal. So the in will actually be able to do its job. And we can do this for actors and for ratings. And be really careful on the cut and paste here because if you forget to change which table you're going from, not good. And this is going to be from actor. There we go. So now our DAO is good. We can now say delete movies by IDs and just pass that movie IDs in. Since we're directly using a list, we don't have to do the convert to an array and spread it out again. And I'm going to simplify this a little bit here. So IDs, IDs, and IDs. Kind of like that. We'll go back to our repository definition just to be consistent. And so now I think our database repository should be deleting things just fine. Our basic repository definition looks good. And then back in our view model, we can say delete by IDs and pass in the IDs. And what is he unhappy about? So we have an immutable set. Oh, it needs, it, he has a set there. We need to convert it to a list. So just say to list. There we go. And then delete selected movies and ratings. And this is movie IDs. And we need to change this to be movies. And oops, and change this one to be ratings. And there we go. So now we have some functions we can call to actually delete the things. We need to just set that up in our main activity for which types of things we're deleting based on the screen we're on. So for the actor's screen, he needs on clear selections and on delete selections. So I have on delete selections and on clear selections. And he's going to need to go to the view model delete selected actors. There we go. And then for clear, we're going to, have to do something kind of similar. Do we have a clear for those? No, because we just defined those selections. So we need to define the, the, a clear for those. So let's say fun, clear, selected actor IDs. And we'll say selected actor IDs equals empty immutable set. and movie IDs and rating IDs. So that should actually just clear what the current selection status is as well. Okay, so this will be view model, clear selected actor IDs. And then we'll come down to the movie screen 
and delete selected movies. And then we'll come down to the rating screen and do him. And these are the types of things. You'll notice there's a lot of things that deal with selection for selected IDs, toggling selection, deleting selections, clear the selections. Those are the kinds of things you may want to group into an object. And you'd have one instance of it for um, dealing with the ratings, one for dealing with movies, one for dealing with um, the uh, actors. And what that would give you is the ability to uh, not get them mixed up. Because right now, it'd be really easy for me to accidentally change that one to say selected movie ID. Or, you know, if I copied and pasted, they wouldn't necessarily all be the same. So having a, an object that actually handles all four of those together would be a good refactor. We can talk about that later. Okay, so now we pass those all in. I think we're in pretty good shape. Now, remember in the, the actors and movies and roles and all that, with roles... We set this up with foreign keys so that if the actor or the movie is deleted, the role will automatically be deleted as well. And so we'll now, when you go back, let's say you delete an actor, you'll no longer see that role appear in the movie for that actor. Let's try running. Okay, no value passed for num selected. Okay, so I need to pass that in. This is for the actor screen. So num selected equals, oh, wait a second. Oh, num selected equals zero because it's not a, not a list screen. Um, so there's a couple of ways we can handle this. We could go to every one of these other screens and set it to zero explicitly, or just go back to movie scaffold and say num selected int equals zero. So if we don't explicitly set it, boom. And let's just double check that we did the right thing for some of these. So like ratings, um, so we have selected, well, the list scaffold gets the num selected passed into it. So wait a second. Oh, but he's passing that to the, the main one. Okay, that's cool. So we got him okay. He looks good. He looks good. And what's up with actor screen now? he needs to have on clear selections and on delete selections. Um, so again, if it's not a list screen, we don't need those. So we can come back to our movie scaffold and we can define default implementations for these. And what I'm doing here is just defining a Lambda that doesn't do anything. It's just an empty Lambda. So if you don't specify them, you get the empty ones by default. Because we're specifying everything by uh, property, by parameter name, when we call them, the order really isn't that important here. If we were calling things positionally, you'd have to make sure that your default ones come at the end of the call. So they'd have to be the end of the parameter list. So let's take a look now and see if we're in better shape. It compiled at least. And let's see what happens when we click on something to select it. Hmm. Okay, so we selected it. We're not seeing the toolbar change up there, which is what I expected to see, but I'm not seeing it. So we're going to have to take a look and see why that is, because right now we can't delete anything. So uh, let's minimize him there. I'm going to close some of that stuff out. And let's take a look at the list scaffold. So the list scaffold has the selected IDs coming in. He passes that in as num selected to the movie scaffold. So the movie scaffold inside of him, he's defining the top bar. If num selected is zero, do top app bar like that. Otherwise do top app bar like that. Oh, you know what I did? I defined this top app bar here, but I'm still hard coding the old one. So let's not do that. And what did I call it? Just top bar up there? Yep. And we could just as easily have put this if statement down inside here. Let's go ahead and run it.
and we'll click, ooh, we have nothing up there now. Let's see what happened there. So the top bar is this guy or that guy. You know, actually, I think I have. Oh, see, yeah, yeah. What's <laughs> I'm not calling this in a in a. Uh, I'm calling it in the wrong context. So what's happening here is, for the movie scaffold, this doesn't actually create nodes that I can return as top bar. This actually each of these uh, composable functions get called emits to the tree. So I'm immediately emitting this top bar to the movie scaffold but I'm not putting it in the right position. So it's not showing up. So there's two ways I can handle this. I can either move this if else into the Lambda here, or I can change the if else to return a Lambda. So I could actually have something like that or inside of here, an extra curly brace. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and move it in. It's a little easier to read. Trying to define a variable that equals a lambda can sometimes be really hard to read because of the extra curly brace that you need. So I'm just gonna take this guy. And just put it in line here. The reason I started doing that the way that I had it um, because I was thinking of a different example I had used at one point where I was altering the actions that were being put on, on the toolbar, not doing the entire toolbar, which is what we needed to here. This should fix that. So now when we're computing the top bar, at that point, it's going to emit the top app bar. And so that's why we're seeing it show up now. And if I click on things, boom. Oh, that's huge. I don't think we want that quite that big. Um, let me get rid of the size specification on that because, wow, that looks bad. But if I click it, notice all the selections go away. So select some, the number of selections changes, click it, goes away. And when I have these clicked, the trash can's visible. So the functionality seems like it's doing right, but oh, wow, that was huge. So let's come back in here and, uh, actually it was in the movie scaffold. So if num selected is zero, here's it's in here. This navigation icon, I'm just gonna let it use the default size. And that should actually fit in better. Much better. So now I get my uh, title and my little back icon, which I can come out. Um, I might wanna have some, I'm gonna put some padding around him because he's, he's right up against the edge there and I don't like that. So let's actually change that to be padding with eight. And let's see how that looks. Little tweaks, happy little tweaks. That's better. I think that looks pretty good. So now let's actually try deleting things. So I'm gonna try deleting these two, the transporter and Jumanji. And if I hit delete, boom, it went and did the delete against the database. That database trigger fires because I was using a flow as my return value, I'm getting the new list back. So now if I go into transporter two, whoops. Ah, a little problem here. Notice how I'm still in selection mode. I need to make sure those selections get cleared when I do that deletion. Uh, otherwise we're left in a fairly bad mode there. Let's come back to our view model. And when we do the delete, we wanna make sure that we clear the selected, in this case, actor IDs, movie IDs, and rating IDs. And so we'll try this out now, see how it goes. And I'm gonna reset my database just to make sure I start clean here. Let's see, between Transporter and Transporter 2, they both have uh, Jason Statham in them. And then, um, Let's go ahead and delete actors instead. Let's uh, delete Jason Statham. So I'm gonna say select Jason Statham, I'm gonna delete him. That did not reset that list. So I get the feeling that I'm, I'm not using the right IDs for the selection in the, in the actor list. This is called cut and paste. 
problems. Uh, let's go back to the actor's screen. He's getting passed in selected IDs. So let's go to the caller of the actor screen and see what's getting passed in for the selected actor ID. So selected actor IDs looks good there. And then we're calling delete selected actors. Let's just make sure that that delete actors by ID, selected actor IDs. And then we clear. Hmm. That is interesting. Let's try that one, running that one more time. So if I delete a movie, he goes away. If I go to the actors, he doesn't. Let's try deleting the rock. He doesn't. Are they going to be deleted when I come back? No. Huh. That's interesting. Oh, so I think what's happening is because I have that constraint, it won't let me delete the actor until the role is gone. Let me just double check if that's how I define this. So actor, actor with roles. What about role? Hmm. I don't see any rule that's saying that though. Let's go to ratings and see if I can delete PG. No. Oh, and why does it say actors at the top? Let's go to the rating screen and see if we can clean that up. Yep, that says actors. There we go. Uh, let's try deleting one that's not used. So it's none of them are getting deleted. Let me come out of the application and come back in. I'm just kind of walking you through some of the things I think of when I'm debugging this. Um, I want to try to see what the state is. At this point, I'm going to hop out of the application and come back in to see if it now has the data updates, which would mean the database got updated, but I'm just not seeing that reflected in the UE. So if I go to actors, no, they're still all there. So why can't I delete these? It sounds like it's debugging time, just so we can see what's going on. So let's find our main screen again, our main activity. And let's look at our actor screen when we're trying to delete the selected actors. Let's actually see what that's doing. Um, before I do that, I, want, I think there might be an issue in the so delete ratings by ID, delete actors by ID, movies by ID. That looks okay. Let's see what the uh, repository is doing. Aha, there's our problem. Once again, with the cut and paste. So uh, I'm trying to actually delete the movies with the same ID. Fortunately, the IDs are different, so that's not a problem. But once I fix this, I'll be in good shape. Let's run it. Let's go to actors. Let's see if Jason Statham can go bye-bye. Boom. And let's see if we can delete PG. And then we have these guys. Now, um, I don't think I set up a foreign key relationship on the ratings. So between rating and movie, movie has a rating ID and I don't have a foreign key relationship. So um, I'm basically gonna be left with a rating ID that's no longer valid. And that's not good. We don't wanna do that. Um, now the direction that we're going in things, you know, since we're not printing out the rating, it's not gonna harm us yet. But at some point, if we printed out what the rating was for that, we'll try looking it up and it won't exist. Um, and that could be bad. So we really want a foreign key on this. And let's see if I can get this right. And let me just take a look at the role real quick and see how I specified that. Okay, so 
The other entity that we want to talk to is a rating. And his ID is ID inside rating. The child column, let's see. Yeah, child column is, is rating ID. Um, I'm actually specifying this in the wrong spot. I want to specify this in, uh, or do I? I think that might be right. Let me just double check here. Yeah, actually, I think that's right. So let's take a look. And what I want to do here is if we update the ID or if we delete, we want to cascade that to the movie. So if we delete the movie, delete the ratings, we should see all the movies with the ratings deleted, which should in turn delete any of the roles that are left sitting out. Uh, so rating ID, rating ID, blah, blah, blah. I think this will do it. And we're going to want to reset our database just so we can make sure we see that everything's working okay. Oops, somebody's not happy. Let's try running it again and see if we get anything in the run. Now, when I'm taking a look for crashes, I usually like to first of all look in the run view. Logcat gives me like all the information, but it's super, super verbose and you have to try to hunt for it. A lot of times on the run screen, if you have some problem starting up the app, you'll see it listed here. For some reason, it doesn't trigger it the first time you run after a change. It'll, that's why it just had it saying running. Um, but then if you just rerun it again, boom. So it looks like you changed the schema, but forgot to update the database version. Okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do here, just as a simple way to deal with the database change here, I'm going to uninstall the application and reinstall it. The alternative would be that I'm gonna have to change the database version number and provide a way to tell it how to migrate. There's an auto migration that works in some cases, but otherwise you have to explicitly put in migration rules. Because this is not a released product, I don't wanna to have to worry about migration. I'm just gonna uninstall the application, which will uninstall the database. And then when I run it again, it will reinstall the database with all fresh set settings. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So on the device here, I'm just gonna to go to the application screen. I'm gonna long press on this guy drag them up to uninstall and say, okay, boom. Now when I run it again, it should get past that schema issue. And it should have no data in the database. So we see no movies. Now when I refresh, boom, I have my movies. Go to my ratings. Let's see, PG-13 has three movies. So if I delete PG-13, the movies should go with it. So I go to the movies, boom, I'm left with just Transporter 2, which was rated R. Um, so that worked out pretty nicely. Let's take a look at the, um, the actors here. Um, if, we, if we click inside Transporter 2, we'll see Jason Statham and Amber Valletta. If we go to actors and delete Jason Statham and go back to movies, Jason Statham is no longer listed in the cast. So it's now doing the right thing there. I had just missed that foreign key between rating and movie, which was pretty important there. Rating was really the parent in that. Um, and it's, you, you could make an argument that it's really not a parent-child relationship. It's just a extra piece of information dangling off of the movie. But if you did that, let's say that we want to, you know, somebody deletes a rating. Um, if you delete a rating, uh, what would you set the rating to as a default on there? You know, maybe you could go back to unrated or something like that. Um, you could do that, but then you have to write some logic for it. So you'd have to check to see what movies have a rating I'm, I'm deleting, and then go ahead and change all of those movies to be unrated before you delete the rating. Um, the other option, of course, is don't let people delete ratings. <laughs> I mean, ratings are a fairly fixed set of things here. Um, but if the application is really dynamic, you wouldn't want to do that. Okay, any questions on anything that we've done here? <clears throat>
Okay, so the next thing that we would do here, there's a couple things that we can talk about. Um, adding things would be something, but I wanna leave that for the exercise. I'm gonna describe what happens when you're adding things and what you need to do. I'm just not gonna code it for you. You're gonna have to figure out how to code adding yourself. Um, the other thing is also in a screen like this where it has cast a transporter too and it just lists the cast and we can click on them. We'd really wanna make that into a, um, uh, a the normal type of list that we've been using. So instead of just using the column of text like we currently are, we would use the same type of list support and set that all up. I really don't wanna go down that path because that would really bog the example down, take a little more time. Um, at some point I may update the example and just post an updated version that has that. But what I wanna do is right now is talk about uh, what you're going to need to do to add things inside the application. Um, and inside your application, when you have a contact that has a list of uh, addresses, when they're in the list here, you're going to have to deal with managing that as a list and not just as a, a, a column of text, as well as adding and removing there. So let's take a look at the concept of what we're going to need to do to add. I'm going to put a little note in here. So new file, and we're gonna call it how to add. And we'll make it a markdown file. So inside here, what, what we're gonna do is, is talk about um, adding movies, adding, uh, uh, let's say just say adding movies and adding um, uh, actors. So if we're gonna add a movie, what we're going to need is on the movie, the, the what do I call it, movies screen? Let me just double check that. So on the movies screen, that's the list. We're going to add a add button to the toolbar. And let's just take a look at what the um, scaffold looks like for that. So we have our movies. Uh, movie screen, there we go. So the movie screen, we've got these top actions being passed in. So we have a place here for you to just add in that add action. And the add action has an icon just called add. So let's jot this down. Okay, and when it's pressed, what do we wanna do here? So we need to create a new movie instance and add it to the database. Uh, and we want to, um, let's see the thing I'm thinking of. Yeah, create a new movie instance and add it to the database. Um, and then make that the selected movie and go to the, the, the movie edit screen. So when we press this, we're going to create an instance of movie. use default UUID, um, default ID equals UUID. So if we take a look at the definition of movie, we're passing in ID, title, description, and rating ID. Uh, so just leave that one blank and you'll get a random ID for it, which is a really good idea. Uh, using the random UUIDs uh, allows you to have many different users on many different uh, devices or on a server even. And whenever they create a new instance, they're always going to get an ID that's unique from anybody else. So that if you do share that with somebody else, maybe you push it into a common database, there won't be conflicts. So you're going to create a movie with that default, and then you can just pass in blanks for these, for the title description and rating. Um, oh, not, you're not doing movies. You're, well, I'll, I'll describe what we're doing for movies, but you're gonna be doing contact, it's just a hair simpler. So create an instance of movie, use default random ID, default ID is that. Use bloop bloop for title and description. Use not rated for the rating. So we're just gonna hardwire that to the ID of not rated. So, and um, the assumption here is we're not gonna delete the, um, 
Let's put a little note here. Change app to not allow ratings to be deleted. Something kind of like that. So we create that instance of the movie. Then we're going to insert it into the database. And then we're going to set that movie to be the selected movie. And then we're going to push the movie edit screen. Boom. And that'll let you actually create the, uh, the movie, fill in the other details. Um, now, if we have a little time today, I'm going to try to see if we can do a, uh, a drop down for choosing a rating so we can change that. Because right now we only have the two text fields. It'd be nice to actually be able to have a way to select a rating for a movie so you can actually change that. So we push movie edit screen and then user edits and presses back to return to, whoops, to movie list, something kind of like that. And so that's the basic flow of doing an ad here. And you're gonna do something kind of similar. You're gonna have a, a plus sign on your toolbar for the ad, um, or you're gonna have a plus sign inside of the uh, the contact edit screen to be able to add in new addresses, things like that. Um, and there you go. So it's, it's not a whole lot to do here, um, but start a coroutine to do all of the following. And this will take, make sure that this all happens in sequence off of the UE thread. Um, and it should be something that's a fairly quick process, but because we're doing IO, which may block for a little bit, depending on what's going on, uh, you definitely want to put this on a background thread. Okay, any questions on that? So adding uh, actors and ratings are similar. Something kind of like that. Okay. So then the next tricky part would be associating, let's say casting actors in movies. And in this case, we need to, to say, you know, if I have an actor, add them to a movie, or if I have a movie, add actors. And so what you'd probably want to do here, and I don't really want to get into the detail on how to do this right now, um, but in movie screen, uh, movie edit screen, have add button next to actor. And note that this is not actually creating a new actor. This is, um, because this is a many-to-many -many relationship, we're just going to look up actors to add them in. When pressed, then we're going to bring up a dialogue. We'll talk about those another time. To search and list actors. And what I would do here is I would have a, a little text field in there that lets you start typing in part of an actor name. And as they change the text, you can look up in the database to see which actors match that. And then tap actor to add. Yeah, I hope I have some time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to make time to, to make sure I do this as an example because doing little dialogues and things is kind of neat in, in the compose. Um, so tap actors to add. Press done when finished, something kind of like that. So that, that might be one way that you could end up uh, adding actors there. And then uh, in the actor edit screen, similar for looking up movies. Um, oh, but we actually have the role to deal with. So the actual, the name of the role and the position. 
Um, so we're searching list actors, um, tap actors to add, maybe uh, bring up another dialogue. to ask for role name and character name and position and credits. And even position and credits, instead of doing that, um, this is another little note here. Position and credits could just be done by drag reorder in lists. There's some support to do that. That's something I probably won't be covering in this course, but I do like to mention that it exists. And it's really not that hard to implement. Um, there's, there's a little work you have to deal with for detecting the drags. Um, unfortunately, uh, Google just released some drag and drop support that works for the view, the view way of doing uh, lists but they haven't released anything for Jetpack Compose yet. Um, there are a few third-party people who have some articles out there talking about how to do drag and drop. And if you just do a search on Jetpack Compose drag and drop, you'll find some of those. And uh, that would take care of a lot of this. And um, it's kind of a nice way to deal with the order in that. You would, after the drags, have to keep updating the database to change the position numbers. Um, but it's much friendlier to the user than saying which number are they in the credits because the user is not going to want to count. They're just going to want to drag and drop, that type of thing. Okay, any questions on any of that? So I'm going to show you the... assignment description that's up there right now. Um, oh, it's actually not going to be there. Well, it's in the old repository. I'm going to do a few tweaks, most likely. Uh, so don't do it based on the online class, but it'll be pretty similar. So this was the description that used to be there. Let me just zoom him up a little bit. Uh, this is going to be your assignment three. Um, what you're going to do is create a brand new project called HW3 and then copy over the classes for your, your database stuff and copy over the, the build scripts. Um, you might be able to do the rename, but uh, it, it can be a little dicey depend, depending on the name that you specified for things. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. I recommend creating a brand new project and then copy over the stuff that you need. Um, for your user interface, um, scrollable. Oh, this is a lazy column scrollable. What was? I'm not sure what this was referring to. Um, something I did in the class videos was doing something. All screens that aren't using. Oh, okay. It's just, I'm having trouble parsing the sentence. Anything that's not using lazy column, you have to explicitly make scrollable. Let me show you how to do that. I'm really glad that actually came up because you need that. Um, let's come back to there. So to make a, a, a page scrollable, um, which is super, super useful in case the screen that the user is working on is small, or you have a lot of fields that you want to edit, um, what we can do is let's go to movie screen or actor screen. All you need to do in here is inside the section that you want to be scrollable, you're going to add a modifier. And you'll say, um, oops, modifier equals vertical scroll modifier. And then you just pass in here, remember scroll state. Now, what remember scroll state does is it sets up a remember, kind of like we were manually doing, to hold on to information about where you are in the list, so where, where the user sees the scrolling. Um, and this modifier at vert vertical scroll, boom, makes your page scrollable. So if you had a whole bunch of stuff in here, let's say this is the actor screen, 
let's throw a whole bunch of extra labels in here. Um, you know, what am I doing? I have code now. I can do this. I can say repeat 100. There we go. And so now if I run this and take a look at an actor's description, I should be able to scroll through it. So we'll go to The Rock, movie starring The Rock. And there we go, it scrolls. Now, one little gotcha with Compose, you'll notice there's no scroll bar. That's something that is being worked on. Um, and you'll notice actually when it gets to the end of the list, you get this kind of pulling effect here that makes it look like you're, you know, you've hit the end and it's kind of trying to stretch the list still, um, which is nice. So it still gives you that effect. But if you just take a look at this screen, there's no real indicator that you can scroll on it. Once scroll is available, I strongly recommend you do not use fade scroll bars. Um, the default on the view setup for uh, things like recycler view or just a list that has, or a page that has a scroller on it, the default is that the scroll bars will fade automatically. Uh, and you won't even see them unless you start scrolling and then the scroll bar will appear. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the way that things are defaulted in Compose, uh, but when they have that, make sure you have to have uh, fade scroll bars turned off. Um, otherwise, the user is not going to be able to know that there's that the thing can scroll. Like if you look at this screen, everything just fits. There's no indication that there's something below that. Um, and apparently I deleted, whoops. Apparently I deleted the roles. Let me just add them back in there. Now we see movie starring the rock and then here's the rest of the list scrolling. And there we go. So that is how you can deal with the scrolling is that modifier vertical scroll. Okay, so um, don't worry about that because that's not going to be a thing. Uh, I will be cleaning this assignment description up, but I just wanted to kind of walk through, kind of briefly describe what's going on here. Um, so you're going to use a stack to keep track of the current screen, just like I did in the movies example. Have a single activity, again, just like in the movies example. Jetpack compose, kind of a given here because I haven't talked about anything else. Um, and then here's a list of the screens that you want here. Um, don't worry about trying to create alternate layouts for side-by-side -side views or horizontal or vertical or anything like that. We haven't really done any of that. I will be talking about that later, how you can adapt the UE based on the screen's characteristics. Um, but what we need here is you're gonna have a contact list. It's gonna be a list of contacts. If there are no contacts, I want you to display a text that says no context found. In the application that we've done so far, it just has a blank screen. I want you to actually display a text if there's no context. Okay. Have a toolbar button that resets the database, just like we did. This one should clear and add some dummy contacts that you used in the movies example. Um, and auto renew, I think is basically the same icon as the refresh. Um, the, yeah, if you add in the extended icons, you'll have that guy. Um, so auto renew will work. I think I'll just, yeah, I'll keep it as auto renew. Less to change in this description. Uh, and let's see here. So you're going to display a scrollable list using a lazy column to display all your contacts. Make sure you sort them by last name, then first name. That's going to be something you have to do in your DAO. Each contact shows up on a card, just like I had the cards for each of the items showing up there. Um, now, depending on what you're doing, you might, uh, you're, you're, you probably are going to want to have a separate lazy column instead of having this common support thing that I did in the example. You'll probably just want to have explicitly inside your, your layouts, just go ahead and say lazy column and do stuff inside there. Um, contact card is going to have a person icon. Um, there's a person icon actually inside. I'm going to change the text on this. We used to have to actually create assets directly. Um, the context first name and last name should appear and the mobile phone number. How you lay it out is completely up to you. You can put them all vertically. You can put some pieces next to each other, whatever you would like to do for the, for the example. Um, I want you to support multiple selection, just like I did. So you can select any number of contacts. And when they're selected, you should have that navigation back arrow, just like I showed, the count of them and a delete action. And uh, 
you know, this will delete all the addresses without giving you any warning. Um, and that's something that would be nice. You know, if somebody hits a delete button, you really want to verify that they meant to do that. Okay. If you click on the person icon, you're going to toggle multi-select. Clicking anywhere else will just go into the contact display. So for this example here, don't worry about long press. Just do it as click on the icon to multi-select, click anywhere else on the card to go to the, the display of the contacts. Um, title should say contacts and pressing create contact button would go to the edit screen. Did I have a, uh, yeah, I have the flow down there. I'll show you in a minute. Okay, the contact display is gonna be a read-only screen. So it's just gonna show stuff to actually edit. Um, make sure it's scrollable. Like that, that's going to be a column that scrolls for that. Display all the data for the contact, all the information on all addresses. So you're going to have all the contact information. And then underneath it, uh, you know, each address, you want to see all the information for the address. You can put that in a list of cards if you want to. You can display it just as a, a, a column of text, whatever layout you want to do on this one. Um, let's see, so you can have an edit bar, it's gonna take you to the contact edit screen. For the contact edit screen, again, make it scrollable just in case it doesn't fit on every phone and uh, put the contact name or the word no name if the name is blank. Uh, let's see, display entry fields, all data is saved as the user types it. So just like I did in the example there. Um, and then at the bottom of the contact edit screen, Display and addresses section that lets you edit it. And so it'll look something kind of like this. You have the addresses label and then a little plus icon over here. And then underneath it, you're going to have individual rows for each of the addresses. So you just want to have the type of the address and the, um, uh, the, the street, I think, is all I put inside there. Um, and then you're going to have a little X icon on each of those to delete it. Um, in this case, don't use a lazy column. Just go ahead and add these addresses directly to the column. So your column is going to have, you know, labels and fields for each of the data on the contact edit. It'll get down here and have some text that shows that, an icon that shows that. Both of these go in a row. And then just have these rows set up there. Um, let's see, to make address expand. Oh, to make each address expand, so each of these pieces of text here, you're going to want to make sure that that expands to push this X all the way to the right. That's where we're going to use a weight on the street so that it'll, the street will stretch and then the icon will have to be at the edge of the screen. Um, that plus button should be green. I didn't really talk about that. Um, let me show you how you, you color these icons. So where's a good example? the list scaffold. No, actually it's in the movie scaffold is where we had the add button. Oh, we don't have an add button, but we have the, uh, do we have a button somewhere? Let's change the color of the, the refresh button. And where did I define him? So it'd be um, refresh. So it looks like it's on each of the screens, actor screen, movie screen, and so on. So let's go to the uh, movie screen. And there's our refresh guy there. So, um, oh, that's just an action there. So let's go to the list scaffold who's actually going to use those actions, passing them to the movie scaffold. And here's where we're actually creating the icon button. So when you have the icon, it's tint. Let me take a look here. Yeah, tint. So you'd say tint equals color dot green, something just like that. And that will make that button appear green. So this will actually change it for every single icon that's on the top, which we don't want to do. Um, but when you're setting up, you want just that one icon to be it. So you see there's the green icon there. 
I switch to other screens, it's green as well. That doesn't really look like green, does it? I guess that is green. It's just, it's weird because it looks cyan when it's, when the green is on top of there. Little optical illusion there. Okay. And um, X buttons. For those actually use the the trash can instead of the, the, the X. And each address is displayed on a card in the overall layout. Don't use a layout as a column. You can format the address cards however you want. Um, you don't need an icon on the left edge of them. And let's see, you have the delete icon, tapping an address card opens the address edit screen, tapping the trash can deletes the address card without warning. Um, plus sign creates a new address and opens the address edit screen. Address edit, display them and edit them, save the data as you type. And then we're gonna have a simple little about screen just because we can. And you're just gonna have a piece of text in there that just says about this application. And you can have whatever text you want on there, um, but at least just say something like about this application. This should be accessible from any screen except the about screen via button on the toolbar. Um, you can uh, use like an exclamation mark with a circle around it is a good one for that. So here's what the flow of the application looks like. So you're gonna have a, a con from your contact list, if you tap, a contact, you go to display. Um, from anywhere, if you tap on about, boom, you go to the about screen. If you're displaying something and you edit, you go to the edit screen. If you tap or tap on or create an address, you go to address edit. Note that there's no address display here. You're just going to directly go to the edit screen for that. Okay, and let's see, one activity. You can use any number of helper classes or files, however you want to do that. You can organize your your classes and top level functions however you want. You could have everything in one package if you want. You could have 10 packages, 20 packages, um, whatever feels reasonable and try to make it make some sense on what you're using. And you can copy as much code as you need from the examples, but make sure you add a, a comment at the top saying that you, you copied good chunks from the example. Um, all your strings must be in the strings.xml file. Any string the user sees that's a hardwired string. Uh, the database, obviously, you know, it's it's going to be dynamic text. And then here's just the normal submission instructions. So not a whole lot for me to tweak. I'm going to tweak a few things here before I post it. Uh, but that's the basic gist. Do you have any questions on that? And you have to figure out the ad logic. Da, da, da. Okay, well, that is all I had for tonight. Uh, the assignment is going to be due in two weeks. And I will make sure I post that with the assignment this time so that it's not uh, uh, something that uh, is just uh, out there. Well, let's see, two weeks. Is that? No, it's not 4th of July. I wait, well, wait a minute. Is it? I want to double check that. Um. No, the fourth is over there. Okay, that's cool. So um, yeah, we uh, it should be good there. If you have any questions, please post on the forums or um, send me an email. And other than that, I will see you next week. Good night.